And a very good evening to you from tonight's Law Report program. Well, as you know, once a month here on the Law Report, we run a legal clinic trying to answer a range of questions on a number of different topics. And tonight, it's again time to open the lines for you to ask that particular legal question that doesn't quite fit into the other topics we discuss here on the Law Report. And just before we begin, a reminder that there's a list of available documents on the Facebook page, Law on SAFM. If you'd like any of those, post a message on Facebook. But please do remember to include your email address or if you don't have access to Facebook, you can email me on law at safm.co.za and I can send you a copy of the list and then you can choose what you want. Well, I'm joined once again this evening by attorney Nicolene skuman Lo. She's a director of Skuman Law Inc., Conveyances and Notaries Public. Nicolene, welcome back to the show. The months just seem to get shorter and shorter. It seems like you were here the other day. It seems like it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, if you have any questions for us, you can call us now on 0892 10 0892 10 2010. Just have three emails to go through. So if you want to call now, you can get through pretty quickly. You can just leave your name and number with my producer and we'll call you back as soon as we're done with these. Right. The first one comes from Prince says, I'm 33 years of age, married for two years and blessed with a son. I would like to have some advice on my marriage. We got married in February 2013, but after a year, we experienced some difficult challenges in our marriage. But all those challenges were things that we dealt with during the relationship. It came to a point where I could not take it anymore, had to deal with cheating many times and dishonesty and the trust has been broken. Having said all that, I've decided to call it a day. I'm working and she's not working. I would like to know where to go to from here. What steps do I have to take considering the divorce? She's not staying in the house. She lives with a friend. She lives with friends because we're always fighting. We're only renting a three-room small house. Please advise. Now, I did actually email to ask Prince how they were married. Was it community of property? Was it um, anti-nuptial contract with accrual or just whatever it was? And I hadn't heard back. So I, it makes it a little more difficult to answer mm. the question. Well, essentially, um, the first point of call would be to get yourself an attorney, a legal representative, particularly when the split is not amicable and there's a lot of fighting as and the there's listener. And there's a child. Um, and there's a child as the listener is putting it. So um, first point of call would always be get yourself um, an attorney if you cannot manage to... Um, Find one um, through your own contacts, um, contact uh, the Law Society or Legal Aid. They'll also be able to assist. Now, this attorney will, the first the first step that you'll take is to issue a summons to get the ball rolling, so to speak, with the divorce proceedings. And um, if you can reach an agreement, then um, you can incorporate that agreement, make it an order of court, and it's what we call an uncontested or unopposed divorce. So... It runs relatively smoothly and it doesn't cost as lot, uh, as much money as, as contested divorces can cost. And um, because it involves a minor child, the family advocate will also have some involvement in the report, uh, producing the reports and to decide who gets custody and, and, and all of those things. So first point of call is to get an attorney. Now, he ma mentions here that... Um He's working, she's not working. If they're married in community property, that doesn't really matter. No, either way, it doesn't really matter mm. because um, essentially what a divorce is, is it breaks the contract of marriage. It severs the marital relationship. So if you're married in community of property, it theoretically, in, in legal terms, forces a split of an undivided joint estate. So it literally cuts the cake in half and it splits it in two. Um, with a anti-nuptial contract, regardless of how you're married, this a similar thing occurs now of course if you're married outside of community of property without accrual then there is already a split so it's all only about those things that could have been um the ownership is is call it hazy we call it often the gray area and um, the longer you're together the bigger the gray area so if well, you have been married for three years two years so you know in, in by all mm. accounts you couldn't have, have um really uh, amassed all that much no mm. totally and um when it comes to the accrual it just kick starts the calculation that that needs to take place can i just ask you something here because somebody asked me this the other day are there now three ways of getting married it's either in community property anti-nuptial as we always knew it mm. and now anti-nuptial with accruals are there is anti-nuptial two different can you have two different types of anti-nuptial yes so i was correct in saying yes i so thought that was right broadly broadly we say there are there's one split in community of property and out of community of property. And as a sub 
a heading, if you want to call it that, or subdivision, you have the, the marriage with or without the accrual system. So you do have the choice that. of having so the accrual broadly or not. So broadly, you've got two choices, with a contract or without a contract. And within the contract choice, you've got two further choices. Okay. So you can either choose to see it as three choices or as 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 one and, and a subheading or a... Okay. Subdivision. So you can decide how you'd like the anti-nuptial contract to be done. Mm. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so there is that choice there as well. Yes. Right. Okay. Next one is from Irene. I have a latest state issue that I need clarity on. She says, my mom died in 2006, leaving an estate worth about 900,000 rand without leaving a will. And my father and his mistress took everything. I would like to lodge a dispute at the Master of the High Court on the matter. The reason that made me delay this was the fact that I was unaware of the fact that I was entitled to a portion of my mother's estate. My dad, when he was winding up my mother's estate, deliberately omitted some property and monies to in ensure that the estate would be less than 125,000. He submitted false value of the house and her car, and he left out the other car. He gave a lesser valuation on the property, and he didn't approach the municipality nor an estate valuator. He gave a verbal estimation. Before I approach the Master of the High Court and institute a formal dispute, I would like to know the following. First point is, to determine the value of my late mom's estate's cars and the house, are we going to use the then value of the property when my mother died, or are we going to use the current value? And the second question is, my mom had a pension fund in which she did not nominate beneficiaries, and my dad took the whole lump sum of about 550000 for himself. I hear that he was supposed to have set up a liquidation and distribution account, of which he did not do. And is it possible to have this matter reopened after such a long time? This was in 2006. Yeah, you know, I always say with estates and, and without bearing, being the bearer of bad news, as they say, um, but essentially, if you, the longer you leave an estate or a dispute that you have against the administration of a deceased estate, the more improbable it becomes to actually claim against the estate or to get restitution. So it's more than that, likely they've gone and spent most of it. Exactly. So practically speaking, if the money is gone, the money is gone. And usually it goes into, let's call it a bottomless pit for ease of, of, of reference so that you don't really, you can't really act against anyone. Or, you know, as you say, the money's been spent and the person who spent it didn't have anything to start off with. So they they in no better position than they were back then. So that's always something that one needs to consider because if you do reopen these cases and institute formal disputes and proceedings, then it costs a lot of money. Yes, you will probably approach the master of the high court, but more importantly, you would institute legal proceedings in a court of law, particularly the high court, to um, basically reopen the estate and all of that. Now, the less than 125,000 is quite a relevant figure. If your estate is less than 125,000 rand in value, you need not file a liquidation and distribution. Which is obviously what he went and did. Exactly. So to answer the second question first, um, you know, there was no or comment rather. There wasn't supposed to be a liquidation and distribution account because of the 125,000. And, <clears throat> and the master accepts this on face value. Now, the other portion is that, um, of course, all the, the children would have um, been listed also as next of kin when all of this was reported. So it's important to go to the master and to essentially um, to, to get to the point of, of what has been done, what has been done appropriately and what has not been done at all or not appropriately. And also when it comes to valuations, valuations are generally taken on date of death. Now, it's, it becomes slightly more complicated the longer you wait with an estate. The fact of the matter is those are the assets that you will have to turn into cash or divide. And if there's a difference between the then value and the now value, there's been damages suffered. And if damages have been suffered and you can prove um, that it was purposefully devalued by, say, the father in this case, then you could approach the court on a damages claim. So this, I'm just trying to illustrate to the to the listener that this can become really complicated. So instead of approaching the master on own accord and to institute a complaint yourself, I would strongly recommend that you do this through a, a firm of attorneys who knows uh, who, who are experts in litigation as well as estates.
Yeah, because it also mentions, <clears throat> excuse me, the pension fund. Yes. And which did not nominate beneficiaries. And mm -hmm. the father took the whole lot. Yeah, of course, if, if you prove if there's no will and you are the surviving spouse, then you automatically become the heir. But surely with no will, they've got to actually find the children. But that would have been, should have been up to the pension fund, surely. Depends on the pension fund's rules. So usually it is spouse that is firstly um, um, entitled to it. And um, usually if the children are no longer minors, the children are not entitled to inheriting from a pension fund. Oh, really? That's generally oh, okay. speaking. Okay. So um, a pension fund is, is meant to look after dependents, so minor children or children that are still dependent because of some form of disability. Um, and then, of course, the, the surviving spouse is the next in line to benefit from this. But the rest of the estate, they should have actually found the children, and that should have been paid out to all of them. In well, again... Under 125,000. Well, apparently it, it, it wasn't, but if it, if he'd done it legally, it, they would have all been entitled to something. I must, I must say this, this was done, um, you know, smartly in a, in an unethical way, of yeah. course. Um, in, in that if you, if you've taken the value below 125,000 and you have, you don't have to file your liquidation and distribution account and you don't, um, uh, it, it's such a small estate, a section 18.3 as we refer to it, that you, if you have to divide it into estate, there simply isn't enough to go around because um, the surviving spouse gets the, the most of either 125,000, similarly a same mm. amount, or a child share, whichever is greatest. Now, if the child share is um, less than 125, then he walks away with the whole 125. <laughs> So <sighs> what I'm trying to tell you is yeah. on paper, this was done correctly. In, so a, in a very this, underhanded, bad way. Yes, and, mm. and the proof will have to really be be put together in a very um, meticulous so way. So this is quite a complicated thing, yes. not something to try to attempt to do on your own, but as you said, rather to find a legal representative to help you through this yes. rather quagmire of stuff. It's going to be quite a, a mission yes. by all accounts. I yeah, I suppose it's like opening the can of worms, as they say. Something like that. Right, Joseph says, please tell me what disqualifies a husband from getting his 50% share from an in-community of property marriage. If his wife shows the divorce magistrate two or three court interdicts for physical abuse, does that disqualify him? If the wife lies to the court saying the husband left as soon as he got his pension money, when he was fired from his job in 2003 and did not give her any money, does that disqualify him if the magistrate believes that? And he, the husband, cannot prove that he gave the money. This sounds not very nice either. No. Um, well, essentially, with a divorce, you cut the, the cake in half and you split, Doesn't split all it for one stuff. another. Doesn't matter. All this other stuff. All this other stuff will give rise to additional issues between the parties. For example, this, um, the interdicts for the physical abuse, that may escalate into criminal proceedings for, for assault and all of that, if, if she can prove this, of course. Um, and then, you know, not sharing pension money, that will obviously be brought up during the divorce proceedings to say, here's the split of the pie, so to speak, and part of the split is the pension money, which, um, you know, you should have included for whatever reason. Mm. However, if, if this is only happening now and the pension was taken in 2003, then I fail to see um, how, how you know, if it, 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 something has happened with that money to make it part of the joint estate anyway. It's either sitting in some bank account or something along those lines, or it's been used to purchase something, either for joint or... or or separate benefit. So essentially everything that gets owned must be shared in half. So if the money's still around for the pension, that will be shared in half, just as much as everything else will. And um, it, that's the only real issue I see with it. It won't preclude you from getting your 50%, but it will affect the calculation and how we get to the 50%. So you're still entitled to the 50% yes. regardless, but yes. there could be some issues yes. with this thing. But the 50% doesn't mean that you don't get anything. No, no, you don't get penalized for, for, other, for no, other things. But the, as no. you said, there could be some other charges or some other sharing of something. There could be some more to that, but the 50% stands initially yes. to start with. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay, let's go to our first caller, Ben in Yeovil. Good evening. Hello, Ben. 
Ben, are you with us? Yeah, oh, there you are. Hello, like Ben. To know, since the, the, the close corporations mm-hmm. have been, it's like they've been cancelled, no longer working. Mm-hmm. And then you go to register a PTY LTD. So now if I convert my CC mm-hmm. to a PTY LTD, do I have to have an, an auditor like I used to have an accounting officer in, in the CC? Mm-hmm. That, that's one. So the, the second one would be this relates to court matters. If I go to court as a complainant, and the court says it needs witnesses. Mm-hmm. Do I have to get witnesses that are going to speak in my favor, or do I have to get witnesses that are going to say what they witnessed on that particular day of the incident? Okay. Let's start yes. with the first question, the yes. conversion of closed corporations to a private company. Uh-huh. In With the enactment of the new Companies Act, Existing closed corporations will continue to exist right. um, a lot with the same registration numbers and the same name. Okay. But new ones can no longer be registered. So you don't have to convert if you're a CC. We say to clients that you don't have to convert, but we recommend that you do. Particularly if you are looking at growing your business and wanting to take in more staff or more yeah. um, shareholders or partners. So the more people you invite into the entity the more the risk the risk starts to multiply now if you're as the fundamental difference between the two organizations or or uh, legal persona is really that you have a a vehicle a closed corporation where in your ownership and management roles are not distinguished from one another the it's the same thing. Now, the, the minute you bring in more partners in that instance, that means those people take part in both ownership and in management. You can't say, oh, okay, I just want you to be a director in my company. You help me yeah. manage X, Y, and Z, but you don't share in the profits, which okay. you can do. And that's why we tell our clients to, um, especially if you're looking at growing your business, to convert. The conversion is a form that you fill in with the CIPC and it costs yeah. a couple of hundred rands, two, three, okay. four hundred rand. It's yeah. negligible. You don't need an account, an auditor. If your auditing will work exactly the same as it worked with the, the closed corporation. So you stick to, to what you have and what you know. Um, when you grow and, and they've got five items of measuring business growth, um, but it's really meant for really big companies, then they compel you to audit. But if you're small, it's your choice, in a nutshell. So so now since the the offices there in Mm -hmm. Pretoria are not open, people are using computers, Mm -hmm. what's what's happening there? Because I'm not too conversant with with a computer to do, you know, the applications and all that uh, amendments. You can approach an attorney to do this for you, or you can approach uh, your accountant to do it for you. Um, They are also pretty good when it comes to this, and it doesn't really involve any legal work. It's more secretarial, company secretarial work that it involves. Or one of these consulting uh, companies that uh, sell these shelf companies that everyone talks about. Those guys can also help you. Oh, I see. And now what about the witnesses? The witnesses to the court case. Well, of course, if you're the claimant, you must prove what you're complaining about, if that makes sense. So you'll you'll get people to collaborate your side of the story. And remember, when you open that up, yes. whoever opposes you will bring, who collaborates their side of the story. So you, you Ben was saying if he if he's got to get witnesses to to an incident, must he bring somebody that's going to collaborate his story? Yes, or, I would advise. Or, him. No, he says, or must he get somebody who's going to tell what they saw on the day? Now, hopefully, it's which either it's way, it's going same. to be the truth. But hopefully, it's the same thing, Ben. It's the same thing. Is it the same thing? Uh, okay. Because are, are your witnesses going to tell the truth, and is that going to be the what really happened? Is that what your story is? Oh, I. See. 
but not those who are going to favor me in, in, in the court, in court. Well, if, if, if your story is a good story and it's the true truth and they're coming to tell that, that you're saying the truth, mm. then that's fine. All right. Don't take so, somebody in there who's going to make up a story and then you're going to get yeah. charged with perjury and all sorts of things. You don't want to do that. The other right. thing is, uh, you know, from, from a, a legal perspective, we always recommend that you, you substantiate what you are saying. So in that context, I agree. You need to bring someone that substantiates your side of the story, but it needs to still align with the truth. So if you're going to, for ex- I'm not suggesting you are, but if you are going to pay someone, for example, to um, have to to um, to bring some form of aversion to the table, they the truth will come out in cross examination. That's what trial attorneys are trained to do. We are trained to get to the bottom of it. So um, spare everyone, I think, not, not only embarrassment, we're not just talking about that, but some serious, some serious repercussions from, uh, from engaging in that. So rather, rather just get people to, to come and say what they, um, what they saw. What the truth is. And yeah. what the truth is, yes, in a nutshell. Oh, so, so which means, you, you see, the people I believe, they, they, they know the truth. Are the people who called the, the police to come and arrest me. And now the police here are trying to, to fabricate take the story. And then they, they, I know that what the witness saw is different to what the police are telling. And now if I say, yes, I do, there is a witness that saw what happened and the one that called the police on the particular day. So they say, no, that is not your witness. We can't, because if you invite that person to come and testify, he won't come since he's the one that called the police to come and arrest you. Now, if you've got somebody else that saw what really happened and that yes. is the truth as you know it, that's your truth, then that's fine. Then I would, Nicolene, yeah. then take that, take that witness. If that witness saw what really happened and you believe that that is the truth, then take that witness. Exactly. And, and you know, if, if it is such a serious matter, then it may very well be worth your while to get someone to help you with the legal representation and not to represent yourself. Okay, no, I see. Thanks very Good much. luck, Ben. All, yeah, Later. all the best. Good luck. Thanks for calling. Bye bye now. Right uh, off to Thunderbell Park, Bongani. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. How are you? I'm very good. How can we help you, Bongani? Yeah, um, I just wanted to inquire. I'm actually inquiring for my uncle. Um, what, what basically happened is my uncle um, was working at work, and then he fell off from the um, from the ladder. And then he sustained injuries. And then what happened is they took him to a um, um, like a GP. And then from the GP, he couldn't get assistance because he has he had um, broken bones and stuff like that. So they the further transferred him to the local clinic. And then from the local clinic, they couldn't help him, and they further transferred him to a state hospital where he was admitted. And then he was there, and the case wasn't recorded as an IUD. So he spent, I think he spent two, two to three weeks at hospital until he got operated. So now he went back to, to work, and he, uh, and then the, he was basically told that um, you are not going to uh, get any earnings because there's no work, no pay practices. So I advised him to go to the Department of Labor to open a case. And then he's been going to the Department of Labor, but they don't um, help him to open up the case. So I just my question is, I just wanted to find out what recourse do we have? Um, can we, do we have anything to do if, like for personal injury? It's not really personal injury. Mm. That that's workman's compensation. I mean, he yes. should have been. That that is a workman's compensation case. I mean, the the fact that they didn't record it isn't your uncle. <clears throat> excuse me, isn't your uncle's fault. It's the company's fault. Yeah. 
Um, bon- I don't know if you want to take this, or I can just ask Bongani to drop me a mail, and I can send it off to Michael Bagram as one of his favorite topics. Mm. <laughs> Bongani, have you got it? Can have you got an? E- can you contact me on an email? Yes, I can do that. Okay, I'm going to put you back to my producer now. Give him your email address, and I will email you, and I will put you in touch with Michael Bagram, our labor lawyer, and he'll. I'm sure he'll be able to give you some advice. Okay. All right. I'll so appreciate hold the line. I'll put you back to him now. Okay, Thanks, thank Bongani. You. All the best. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now, I think my, Michael Bayron gets very upset with these sort of things because a lot of companies sort of say, oh, no, we're not paying you, when by law they have to pay you for three months and then they have to claim that back from workman's compensation. But they mm. say, oh, well, you know, it takes them forever to get their money back, so they're not going to pay you. They can't do that. You're injured on duty, you're injured on duty. Do Sorry for you, things? you have to pay. Exactly, yeah. You know, <clears throat> so no, I'll, if Bongani just emails me, I will... Um, set Michael Bagram onto this <laughs> you'll love that right okay off to the Northern Cape Neville good evening hi good evening hello how can we help you Neville uh, yeah well, a quick question a uh, question should I say regarding a, an estate for a friend of mine uh, her husband passed away uh, daughter's stepdaughter are appointed as an executor uh, there's a question how and what uh, Lucy sets he's a marriage contract uh, out of community of property um, the the no communication from the executor, the stepdaughter that was appointed by the other step children in the say, brothers and sisters, etc. Um, no communication, and that's where it stands. Uh, one loose asset was removed by the police um, in terms of a vehicle. Mm-hmm. The other fixed asset was sold. I don't know whether it's been transferred or whatever, because there's no communication. We have spoken to the uh, lawyers. They uh, say, well, it's client uh, confidentiality, and that's as far as it goes. Okay. Well, any deceased estate that has been reported um, is matter of public record with the master of the high court. So I would recommend that you um, uplift the file, as we call it. In other words, go to the master's office, ask for the file, make a copy of it, and take that to your own attorney. You are entitled to legal advice. And it's inter- interstate as well because there was no wall, so that also complicates the matter as well. Yeah, to a certain degree it does, and it also um, it also extends the, the administration time, unfortunately. Okay. So um, I would say the first stop is really to go and make that copy of that file and to get someone to have a look at it and to uh, represent you. Okay, the non-communication by the executor that was app- that has been appointed. Uh, what does one do with that? Do you write to the master and say, "Look, I'm getting mm. no communication." You can complain with the master of the high court, um, yeah. but that, in in my practical experience, that does take a lot long time to um, to resolve, and it's really something that um, people don't really get the recourse they are hoping for. The oh. Yes. The, the master take tends to to have a lot to have to handle, and um, they they don't particularly act um, uh, speedily when it comes to this. Okay, good. But there is so, correspondence with the master already, so we'll just okay. have to persevere. And carry I think on persevere, and but but still maybe go if if you want to still go and get yourself your own legal opinion on what should and shouldn't have been done and all of that. And okay, usually good. when two attorneys are involved, one for the executor and one for the rest, you tend to see the wheel turning much quicker than it used to be for. Okay. All the best. And just one quick, you, you, you're her, the other person's attorney can't say this is client privilege, attorney-client privilege, when it comes to something like this, because as you say, it's open, it's public record. It depends on what basis the attorney said that. So if, if the, the heirs and the executor are not on such good terms, let's put it that way, um, and all sorts yes. of things are being said from either side. Uh, the attorney may very well be able to uh, legitimately invoke the attorney pli- cli- client privilege, tongue twister, okay. attorney client yeah. privilege. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very okay, much. Okay, Neville, sounds like you've got some work to do there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Thanks for calling. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. You're tuned to SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader. I'm Karen Key, and this is The Law Report. My guest tonight is attorney Nicolene skuman Loan. She's a director of Skuman Law, Inc., Conveyances and Notaries Public, practicing here in Cape Town. We're doing a law clinic this evening, so no fixed topic. And if you have any questions, you can call us on 0892-102010, 0892-102010. John in Krugersdorp, Good evening. Good evening. 
My question is regarding the decision by the Small Claims Court and the review to that decision. Uh, each time it was found in my favour, but the defendant is still ducking and diving. What would you recommend I do, please? Well, it really depends on, on what you mean by it's been reviewed. Um, you know, if it's been, been legally reviewed or, or if there's an appeals process going on or, or, or the, as the case may be. Um, we often deal with matters where um, a defendant's plaintiffs, depending on, on where the decision didn't go a particular person's way, so to speak, would actually institute... Um, review or appeal proceedings repeatedly in order to stay the um, the potential um, execution against the the court order because remember that the the minute you you start appealing a decision then you put a hold on um, or a pause button on on the execution process and that's really what m many of them try and achieve through this it's a very costly way of going about it but um, that's what happens in practice so once the appeal processes have been exhausted um, then you can start um, your execution process so unfortunately if if this is continuing and it's gone through the magistrates court and the district court the regional court and it's gone through the high court the next step is um, supreme court of appeal and constitutional court so it can it can really go all the way but of course the the higher up you get particularly from the high court upwards yeah the more difficult it becomes for them to do that because there are very stringent rules as to what constitutes a review and an appeal and all of that john when you said your the, the other party was ducking and diving is this what you meant is he taking it sort of further and further up the court case thing or is he just trying not to pay and, you um, he has told me i've met him on two occasions once when I was in the sheriff's office and he came bustling in, and the second time at the third court date. But he's told me he can draw the, he can draw the case out for 10 years. <laughs> and I'm 77 now. That will oh. be another seven and a half years to go. Is that possible oh from the defendant's side, please? It depends what they are raising as, as a appealable ground. If... Um, if there was a mistake in the decision-making process by the first yeah. um, presiding officer, then it may be a legitimate appeal or review. Mm. But often I found that these are not legitimate. It's just a delay tactic. But don't you find the courts get a little bit upset with people like this taking up good court time for nothing really, for frivolous, just because he's just trying to be difficult? Of course, and, and, and I feel exactly oh, as <laughs> frustrated about it, but... The, we must understand that each of these courts functions as a separate unit, so and they don't really talk to one another. But even so, I so mean, you don't see the train of events. You only get the latest appeal on your desk. So, um, but how often do you see a small claims court exactly award going through this? No, of course not. This is this is quite. Um, I mean, the, what is the limit on a small claims court claim? I mean, it's it's what. 15,000. 15, yeah. Well, say it's, it's less than 20. Um, but this guy carries on like this, uh, John's opponent, is going to start costing him a whole lot more than that to keep going further and further up the up the chain. Yes. He's just trying to be difficult. Yes. Is he so just trying I, to be difficult, John? Can I can I sue for all the time wasting of the officers of the court? Yes. As, as I say, it's been going on for two and a half years. Well, you can sue I, for I'm all your really costs. I'm not for any cash myself. I'm prepared to donate everything everything that he owes me to mm. cancer and hopefully he will double it and he will prove what he is by donating the same. <laughs> That's my <laughs> It doesn't idea. sound like he will there, John, not not after all of this. But, but can John sue him for, for your for his time wasted and all that sort well, of thing? Well you can bring mm. a damages claim and you can obviously recoup all your costs. Yeah. Um I would recommend that you, you get a really good attorney on your side that can deal with this swiftly. I will do the, that. The problem is when people represent themselves, the courts are lenient or more lenient than they would be when you have representation because they consider the fact that you are um, a lay person and you're not trained in the field of law. So you tend to get away with more um, if you want to 
play the game, so to speak. Yeah. Um, we, we've seen people doing all sorts of funny things in, in court representing themselves, and, and m most of us can see through it. And um, the judges find themselves in this position where they have to give these guys the benefit of the doubt, and that in itself results in in delays. You maybe need a savvy lawyer that's going to ask the right questions and get this guy to trip himself up. Yeah, something like that. Here's being me being all mean, John. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate exactly what you're saying. We've had seven court dates sure. of which the defendant has attended one. No, well, that's ridiculous. And I've been there for each of the seven over two and a half years. Oh, no, the first one started. And you still sound so happy, John. Well, I'd like to teach this person a lesson. As I say, I'm not looking for anything mm. really out of it. So he can get the costs and he can double it and we can donate it. This is what I'm going to tell my attorney. Well, that, mm. that sounds like a plan. Maybe he'll think twice next time he tries to do this. I would, I would think so. Let's hope so. Thank you. Well, very good much luck, John. Yeah, it sounds like luck. you've been on quite a mission. I hope it ends soon. Mm. Thanks for the call. Bye. Bye bye now. Right, uh, Lesejo, good evening. Uh, good, good evening, good evening, madam. Hello, how can we help you, Lesejo? Yeah, my, my question relates to the marriage and committee of property. Um, it, it is commonly known that if you are married in committee of property, you've got to share the estate, you know, equally. And even if you put a matter across to say uh, somebody has had one, two, three has happened, you still have to share in community uh, uh, equally, uh, disregarding the fact that somebody caused you know, the break in the marriage. Is it true that the court will just ignore the side of the story of the person who feels he has been offended in that marriage? Yeah, unfortunately, our... Um Divorce law has changed to the degree um, back quite a few years ago. Whoever caused the breakup of the marriage would be penalized um, financially or otherwise. And um, so, for example, if, if the marriage were to break up due to unfaithfulness, the unfaithful spouse would be financially penalized and would not be able to necessarily share in, in what they would have normally have been entitled to. Unfortunately, that's been done away with quite a few years ago. So we, we base our divorce proceedings on the no-fault principle. So it's simply uh, call it the once and, well, without becoming too technical, we refer to it as um, the, the once and for all rule or the, um, the clear break principle so that you cut the tie and you go your separate ways. And with that comes to divide the the joint estate, regardless of whose fault it was. Uh, the argument I always have is that, you know, um, where a community of property exists, there should be community of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So now, if somebody has been very much irresponsible in the marriage, With uh, money. I think whoever feels, you know, uh, offended, uh, uh, should be given some consideration in terms of forfeiture of uh, um, or, or, or of the proceeds. Well, that's how it used to be. Uh, but to, it isn't to a anymore. certain degree, how it how it used to be. Um, the problem is with that is that it's it's the marriage contract is a very intimate and the most special contract in my view that that one does would get in in your lifetime. And it does come with a lot of responsibility. That is very true. It's also one of the most intimate contracts that we'll ever enter into. Which means if it breaks up, it it really does cause damage beyond the pocket um, and far-reaching. So I, I agree there should be a degree of responsibility. But um, the problem is how do you prove what my perception of, of hurt and irresponsibility is versus what someone else's is. It becomes a very complicated argument, and it's one of the reasons why we no longer follow the principle. And it's also not in line with our constitution. So um, it, it's an unfortunate truth, but there are other ways. If you feel um, 
that uh, you had a better standard of living during the marriage and as a result of what this person did, it's lowered your standard, you could potentially claim for spousal maintenance. Whether or not that would be an, a successful claim, I can't advise. It will depend on the exact circumstances of, of the case and what exactly went wrong. Oh, happy to hear that, which means one has to have a proof. Yes, unfortunately, and that's why it, it becomes difficult. Th thank you very much for that. Thank you, Laseko. I hope that, that helped you a bit. It means the door is not closed, you know, for one to prove. No, I think you, you need to sit down and, and get yourself some legal counsel that they can advise you appropriately on exactly what's going on with you. Remember, I'm just giving you some general pointers, but they need to drill down and, and see what exactly is going on in your situation and give you options. Thank you very much. Okay, Lesejo. Thanks, you. For, thanks for getting through. Good night to you. We've got a little bit of time left, so maybe one or two more calls if you haven't called through yet. 0892102010. Vusi in Ladysmith, good evening. Good evening, ma'am. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good, ma'am. I've, I've got a question here. In 2011, November, I was involved in a car accident. Then last year, December, I received a summons whereby the complainant is claiming 240000 for damages. But my question, he admitted that he was wrong on that day. He paid for my car to repair my car. But now, all of a sudden, he came back to claim for 240000 from me. So when did this accident happen? It happened 2011 November. And he waited two, three years? Two well, years. if the summons arrived only now four years. Well, the end of last year. Oh, I, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't hear that. The end of last year. Yeah, so it's oh, three years. okay. So then, you may you may be able to plead prescription. It depends exactly when the accident happened and when exactly you got the summons. If okay, it's a, so even if it's a day after three years, that's what you can use to um, make this go away. Okay, I, I submit my plea, but now I'm the. Give me information last week. They said they are waiting for a court date. Yes, that's for trial. So you've you've reached the end of the line in the preparation phase, um, which means it will be quite hard for you to um, amend your papers at this point. But I was, I'm interested, Vusi, what is he claiming it for? It's, uh, for? For the damages of his vehicles. But if he admitted he was at fault and he paid for your repairs, how can he now suddenly come and say you owe him? Well, how much was it? He, he paid me about 20000 because he only fixed the body of my vehicle. Okay. And now he's claiming 240000 for his vehicle. 240000 240000 Yes. Well, was he driving a very fancy sports car? He was driving a latest BMW. It was latest by that year. Latest BMW. But how, I mean, how can he admit liability, pay the damages, and now something surely, to, actually... You know. Surely there was a... Uh, you reported this to the police... On yeah, the day the of the accident? Are, the police are around when they took the statement. Okay, so you've got the 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 um, case numbers and you can use that now. Yes. Okay, so that's a very important uh, document or documents that you'll you'll have to put forward at this at this new case. And um, you need to look exactly at the date of the accident and the date of receiving the summons. So that you could look at the three year period. Remember, the three-year period relates to when claims expire or prescribe, as we call them. So okay. there are two things you can look at. When exactly the accident happened or when you received the summons. And if that's even a day after three years, then that's where their claim ends. Regardless of all these other um, merits that we, we're putting forward, that addresses it right then and there. And then, of course, if, if it's within the three-year period and that theory can't work, then um, your next step is really to um, to approach the police for copies of those records. Okay. Do I have to hire an attorney for this matter? Because I would recommend. Because I can't afford the, the attorneys. Well, I would recommend that you do. If you can't afford it, then you can always go to legal aid. Um, they They can help you with legal representation. 
Or you can go to the Law Society and maybe someone is willing to help on a pro bono basis. But Vusi, this isn't something if you go into court that you must try and do yourself. No, it's High Court also. So, Or is it Magistrate's Court? It's a Magistrate Court. Okay, well, then obviously if it, it's been recently uh, um, issued then. There are some attorneys mm. that would work on a contingency basis. Um, not not sure how um, that would work in this case, though. Yeah, usually they work on contingency when it comes to medical negligence, mm. uh, road accident fund claims, and you know related related. Um, not unfortunately, not pure litigation always. I think you'll struggle to find someone. But between the Cape, well, the Law Society, not the Cape Law Society particularly and the Bar Council of that particular area. The Bar Council can always help you with an advocate and they can then contact the Law Society for an attorney. So that okay. you, you have um, representation in both forums. It is a larger amount, which I think they would consider. Okay. But good luck, Vusi. But luck. Go, go and have a look at those dates, Vusi. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, check those out first. Thanks for getting through. Good night. Uh, Fisle in Durban, good evening. He's got one of those questions I think that we all want to know the answer to. Fisle, good evening. Good evening. How are you? Carmen uh, and, and you okay? Very well. Hi. I'm dying for you to ask this question because it's a question I think we all want to know the answer to. Yes. I want to know why uh, it's costing so much to defend yourself in court. Yes, please. But that is my first question. Uh, and the second one is that why court keys bail to someone that found on cause of the criminality? Like, like maybe we found someone is raping a child. Mm -hmm. Then we take them to the police, and then the court say, now we're going to give him a bill. Then, that is, that's what I don't understand. If you had phoned at the beginning of the program, Fisley, we wouldn't have actually had any other calls on the show because I'm sure it was going to take Nicole a whole hour to explain all of that. We've got five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, when it comes to the costs, it depends yeah. generally which court you go to. Um, the higher the court, in other words, if it's high court upwards, you you need an, an advocate to assist with the matter. So it means you're not just paying an attorney, you're also paying an advocate. So generally speaking, that's that's what escalates the costs. What, what's more is the bigger the law firm, unfortunately, the, the bigger the bill. So not always, but generally speaking. Um, many of the larger firms are more negotiable when it comes to their fees because they've got larger teams that they could work in. But so generally speaking, the larger the firm, the, the larger the bill. Uh, it means that we can say that we are not equal in front of, the, of, of, the, of, of our law or in our court. Because if uh, like you have more money, you can be able to do that. But if you don't have money, you're going to jail. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily, but um, the other factor that I just wanted to mention before I respond to what you just said is that the opponents, defendants, the other side of the coin usually knows all the tricks in the book, as they say, as to delay matters. And the more delays you have with court appearance upon court appearance, with people showing up and others not showing up, um, that escalates costs. Similarly, if, if there's a lot of letter writing between the parties because everyone is fighting with one another. So it, it really, the only way you can limit costs in litigation is if people really work together. And that's why one of the reasons why they've now introduced this new court-based mediation, which is to try and narrow down on issues between people before they go to court. So I think we're heading in the right direction as a le legal fraternity and as government. But um, quickly for me to respond to, to your uh, further comment, no, in, in my opinion, I don't think we are all equal in front of the law um, mm. in terms of being able to afford good legal services. Um, yes, we all have access. We can represent ourselves. Um, but the process is, is just too overwhelming and too complicated for the normal guy on the street. So you do have a disadvantage to someone who does have legal representation. And I don't think anyone can really legitimately argue that away. So in my view, from a philosophical point of view and from a personal belief system, I do agree with you. When, second, second question. Okay. We're running out of time. We've got yes. four minutes left. And we've got one more call I want to try and squeeze in. Why do people get bail? Well, 
Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Good questions. Okay, thanks. Well, the the issue with, with bail is really that it um, you can only withhold bail when the person is a flight risk or an immediate danger to society. And um, although I don't practice criminal defense law, that's a very... Um, that's a statement or, or a yardstick that's very much open to interpretation. But there have been so many cases of people being put out on bail and then going off and doing exactly what they got bail for doing in the first place. But you see, um, bail, the purpose of, of granting or denying bail is to prevent the flight risk and to a certain degree to prevent the reoccurrence of, of offences. But how can you really predict it? Yeah. You know? um, it? It's a very complicated story and I think we've, we've, we need some insight from, from various channels in order to um, really address the, the lacking of our criminal justice system. Right, we've got a few minutes. Moses, good evening. If you can be very brief, we can take your call. Hello, Moses. Hello. Hi, if you can be very quick, we've got two minutes. Okay, uh, my question is regarding the small team court. Okay. Like... Uh, I had a, a guy to help me with a, a, a bohog. So that guy, I paid him the money, but he didn't finish the work. So I, I took him to a small claim court, then the magistrate ruled against him to pay me some of the money that didn't finish the work. So now the matter is in uh, on the on the sheriff to, to attach his uh, property and mm -hmm. be able to collect the money and pay me. But mm -hmm. now, like since the magistrate ruled against him, it's about uh, two years now without uh, the, 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 like uh, any response from the sheriff. So I just want to know what must I do if I'm not happy with the sheriffs? Well, you can report the sheriff to the board of sheriffs. It's their professional body. Um, I would recommend that you try and go to the sheriff's office, make an appointment. Um, and and speak to him or her first mm -hmm. and if that fails to report them to the sheriffs the board of sheriffs two years is a, an unreasonably long time that that's yeah. unacceptable in yeah. fact i think you would be quite lenient if you were to go to the to to their office and and try and resolve the matter amicably i think that would be very lenient of you to not just straight go to to the reporting phase but there is okay. something you can do, Moses. There is the Board of Sheriffs, yeah. so you can take it further. Okay, thank you. I didn't know about it. Thank you. Thanks so much for the call. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. Good night to you. Bye. Well, my thanks once again this evening to Nicolene Skuman Lo. She's a director of Skuman Law Inc., Conveyances and Notaries Public, practicing here in Cape Town. And she's been my guest on tonight's edition of the Law Report program. And we'll be running legal clinics like this one on the second Monday of every month. And Nicolene will be back with us again for another law clinic on Monday the 13th of April. I can't believe it's April soon. Nicolene, mm. once again, thank you so much for joining me. This year's flying by. Thank you so much for having me. In it's an shocking to flash. I know, April. April. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Law Report is on the air on SAFM every Monday evening between 9 and 10. And a reminder, there's a list of available documents on the Facebook page, Law on SAFM. If you'd like any of them, post a message on Facebook. But please do remember to include your email address, or if you don't have access to Facebook, you can email me on law at safm.co.za. 